know what it costs. Yeah, I hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, yeah, run it, run it. Oh, I really feel it's my time. Think it's my year. Yeah, yeah. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the morning show here on Stock Market TV. Spencer Israel, JC Perez. No Steve today. Steve is out doing conference things down in Miami. We'll be back tomorrow. Uh, big show nonetheless, though. We have the one and only downtown Josh Brown coming on, I guess, in about a half hour, around 9 o'clock Eastern time uh, for that. Uh, our own uh, Sam uh, Gatlin will be on uh, later on in the show towards the end, around 945. And, um, yeah, hope you all had a great weekend. Hope you all enjoyed the game. It's ate, ate some good food, had some good drinks, enjoyed some good company. Good morning, chat. Good morning, everyone there. Do me a favor. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that thumbs up button for me, please. Thank you. Let's bring JC on and uh, start the show. Hey now, Spencer Israel. Welcome everybody to Red Day. Uh, I don't know if you got the memo, Spencer and I. Uh, we you know, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this first. Just so for the a second. reason. So is the reason it's red because the Chiefs won, or is it because uh, the Dow was down on Friday, hundred points on the futures? First off, no, we we did not plan this. This, this is just the way it happened. Um, to answer your question, JC, I don't put that much thought into my wardrobe every day. I. Just to be totally honest with you, I really don't. I go in my closet. I, I say, "Hey, I've worn this shirt for a minute," and then I wear it. That's 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 my um, thought process. So. How hungover? How hungover are you? I, I don't. I don't. Drink, I'm not a big drinker, so I'm not. Yeah, me neither. Yeah. Um. I not that I'm not a big drinker. I just didn't drink a lot last night. Yeah. Uh, I suck to the wine. You know, everyone's asking about the oxtails. Let me tell you something about these oxtails. Let me tell, tell me you something. something. I feel like Stephen A. Smith. Um. <sighs> They're so good. I they're so good. I just I can't get enough of them. They're just they make me so happy. You squeeze that lemon on top. Oh man, they're good. I made some black beans to go with it. Oh, I don't. I don't think I've ever had oxtail. Oh, your life has gone horribly wrong. Uh, yeah. Oxtails are fantastic. Three whole oxtails, man. Uh, fan favorite. Everybody loves it. Um, shout out to the city of uh, Kansas City. Kansas City Chiefs, how about that big win? Uh, yeah. right. Andy Reid, yeah. shout out Andy Reid. What? Shout out Brittany Mahomes. New what? Uh, what Mahomes. a what a horrifically boring game until the fourth quarter. And that was just boring. A, it was a good game. You had fumbles in the first quarter. I thought that was a good I, game. I was bored out of my mind watching that game until the fourth quarter. Then then it got good. See right. This, but, see what I'm dealing with these millennials. You see these millennials? They can't just sit there and watch a game and enjoy it. You know, shout out to the Swifties, right? Shout out Swifties. Welcome to football. It was, uh, you know, it was a good, good showing uh, for your first game. No, I thought so. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, it ended up being a, a fantastically in interesting game. Um, Almost went into double OT. So wait, I was wondering about that. What was the point of the clock? No one at this party I was at could figure out why there was a clock in in, in overtime. If everybody gets a possession. And then it's sudden death thereafter. Because, Who needs it? because it was it was still their first possession. So wait, what would have Patrick happened? Had such a long drive that they were that they were still it was still the first time that each team got the ball. So, it would wait, have so continued. what would have happened if the clock went to zero? Then they started again. And it goes to a new quarter. That's why they weren't uh, calling timeout because it didn't matter. Okay, so it really doesn't matter. Okay, that's 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 it what it does I matter. It does matter, but in this case, it didn't because it was still their first possession. If it if they had already gone back and forth and punted a few times, it would have mattered. You understand? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because no. no. it's not it's not, not going to end in a tie, obviously. So, all right. Um, obviously, what is this uh, soccer? <laughs> Come on. All right. Let's uh, yeah. go. Hit it. All right. Let's talk about the markets here. We we got some things on the mind to discuss. So over the weekend, I. Uh, I was thinking about the markets, right? It's a great time for me to think about the markets uh, when the markets are closed. You know, go outside, go for a walk, spend time with the family, put the baby down, get the milk ready, you know, doing 
doing other non-market activities. You know, it's it's a great time to, you know, randomly think about stuff. And, you know, one of the things that I was really uh, kind of surprised about as I was kind of looking through some statistics is that the U.S. dollar index futures are up every week this year, six weeks in a row, right? And you can see that strong negative correlation, um, you know, since, since really about 2016 between the dollar and, and the S&P and risk assets in general. And while the S&P has continued higher, the majority of stocks on the New York Stock Exchange, I think it's like almost 60% of stocks in the New York Stock Exchange are down for the year. Uh, so even, uh, even, even with strength at the index level, uh, the actual stocks are, you know, essentially listening to the dollar uh, as, the, as the dollar is falling. Something else that's really interesting, I was talking to Sean about it on Friday, Obviously, we have puts in the, uh, we've got March puts, so we got plenty of time in uh, S&Ps and NASDAQ. And those positions aren't working, obviously, as the S&P and NASDAQ have continued higher. But all our short positions and put options and, and bearish strategies, we've got some put spreads too. On the individual stocks, most of them are all either working or flat, right? So what we're seeing in our actual trades is definitely a reflection of what the market itself is doing, right? Our index positions that are bearish are not working and the indexes are going up and the individual positions uh, that were bearish are working or are flat. So, and you can also see that in the individual components of the market as well. So our positions really reflect what's happening in the market. And that's an interesting dynamic as well. Another one, uh, you know, stock market made new all-time highs on Friday, right? That's the headline anyway. Stock uh, market. Yeah, Dow was down 100 points <laughs> on the futures. Uh, VIX was up also on Friday. That was interesting. Um, granted, uh, the VIX is, you know, very low, very muted. And uh, in the 90s, uh, the VIX was, you know, 20 to 30 the whole time in the back half of the 90s. And uh, stocks did great. So uh, a higher volatility index doesn't necessarily mean it's bearish for stocks. It's more of a volatility regime and, and you know, how you treat that, right? We want to... We want to approach the market differently when volatility is low you know, versus volatility being high. Obviously, volatility is very low right now. So the positions were, generally speaking, at the, at the individual stock level, volatility has definitely picked up this year. But uh, at the index level, still relatively low. So that's what's, that's what's on my mind. Uh, Spencer, any thoughts on any of that? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean the VIX being the VIX being up, it, it's not even worth a men it, it's not even worth a mention, frankly. It wasn't down, you know, wasn't down though, which is a little surprising. Right? Yeah, Dow futures it, down a hundred points to end the week. No, doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. No, 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 no. All right. Um, no, I, I, I'm up still, on slide three there. Slow throw up slide we're, three. We're we're still we're still in the uh in the the S and P five thousand headline wave, right? We're still getting yeah. all because 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 of the close on Friday. So those headlines take a few days to like trickle through, and 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 then and then maybe we saw the news a little bit, right? But for the moment, it's still we're still in that in that S and P five K kick. Um, another interesting one. Saturday night, uh, right? Was it Saturday night? Do I have this right? Um, the uh, the Biden tweets on on uh, on Saturday night. Did we uh, did we did we catch that? Uh, what? No. February February the tenth. Right, so that's what is that Saturday night? That's Saturday. Uh, so February the tenth, Saturday night time? at uh, twelve thirty p.m. Right, so this is in. So this is what technically Friday night then, right? Oh no, sorry, it was not at night. This is the uh, the afternoon, twelve thirty p.m. Uh, here, I'll throw it up. Throw up. Uh, throw up the the new, not that one. Throw up the new slide too. And that was uh, uh, your president uh joseph joseph biden uh good news folks as we start the weekend the stock market is going strong uh stock market going strong is a sign of confidence in america's economy first of all uh this guy or his intern think that the stock market is strong so if you also think the stock market is strong this is the company that you're in how do you feel about that uh spencer <laughs> Just because some person that you may or may not like agrees with you that doesn't necessarily make it wrong, <laughs> I right? I don't dislike the guy. I have no problem with the guy. 
Seems like a nice fellow. I don't. I don't have any issues also, with him. Also, how many times has the president come out and said, "Oh yeah, the market really." No, I gotta tell you, not looking great. <laughs> you know, like never. Well, well, I'll tell you this. You know, if this was Trump, for example, um, you know, this has nothing to do with politics. But if this was Trump, it wouldn't matter because Trump used to talk about the stock market all the time. It's true, right? So it's true. It doesn't matter. It's like the boy that crawled uh, cried wolf. Yeah. In this case, how often is Biden uh, talking about the market? In fact, when Trump was president, he would talk about it all the time. Biden would always tweet out about how the average American isn't in the stock market and how the stock market doesn't matter. So isn't it convenient that now all of a sudden it matters, right? Convenient. How about the uh, the tweet last night? What was that all about? Dude, we, I, uh... I, I, I just I just saw that. And I uh, and I, I, I don't I don't follow Joe Biden on Twitter. Um, so maybe, yeah. maybe you should start. Uh, may, maybe I should. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. What what is the tweet? Just like we drew it up and uh, Joe Biden with laser eyes, huh? Laser eyes. And Bitcoin immediately reversed uh, right on that tweet, right on a dime, really. Uh, Right at those uh, January highs, Biden with the laser eyes coming in hot. Coming in hot, Biden with the laser eyes. Didn't see that coming, uh, Spencer. Hey, speaking of of Bitcoin. we're, we're we're up against those those highs. We are we are up against those and uh, failing right as uh, laser eyed uh, Biden uh, comes out. Wow, uh, yeah. very aggressive there from Biden over the weekend. Didn't see that yeah. coming. I don't know. me a little off guard. Not gonna lie. I don't know. Uh, let's just do a quick little rundown. Dow futures down forty five points after uh, being down a hundred points on Friday. Uh, S and P futures are flat. Uh, Nasdaq futures flat. Uh, bond futures up slightly, 24 basis points on the 30-year yield. Silver up a percent and a half today uh, with gold uh, down slightly, basically flat. Copper flat uh, after after getting crushed last week. Uh, crude oil down a percent uh, and the dollar uh, coming back after uh, after selling off slightly in the uh, in the overnight session. Uh, and then in the old uh, in the old cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin is down 350 points uh, since that Biden tweet. Uh, right around 47,000, uh, just under 48,000. And Ethereum uh, down as well, down about a percent, just under 2,500. And of course, uh, Solana uh, right around uh, 104. And tr- total crypto market cap, 1.75 uh, billion. One of the things that I was looking at um, you know, over the weekend was the Bitcoin dominance chart. You see that, Spencer? Yeah, you, there was a lot of good charts. I, you know, this morning was great. Uh, I, I, I was reading chart tunes yesterday as well. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff out this weekend from 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 the team. Um, here, throw up, uh, throw up slide four here. Oh, hold on. Oh. Yeah, throw up slide four there. You know, so this is the Bitcoin dominance. So this is Bitcoin's market cap. As a percentage, percentage of total market cap, right? So Bitcoin's market cap uh, was around 927 billion, uh, which represents about 53% of total crypto market cap, which is about 1.7 trillion. But pushing up against new multi-year highs in Bitcoin dominance, some people are like, "Well, JC, why does this matter?" You know, it, it, it matters in a lot of different ways. Um, but one of the ways that I, you know, for me, it's a relative strength thing, right? So it's like, okay, do we want to be in the Bitcoin or do we want to be in the altcoins? Um, I think in this environment, based on the weight of the evidence, it's it's both, right? Uh, both have been working, the Bitcoin and the altcoin, uh, the altcoins, um, Freudian slip there, the altcoin Ethereum, obviously a big player in the uh, X Bitcoin market cap there, obviously. Um, just to- yeah, you know, I'd be curious to see the Bitcoin Ethereum, Bitcoin plus Ethereum divided by total crypto so because. it would be uh bitcoin plus ethereum so it would be total total three right is that right yeah crypto market cap excluding btc and eth uh is right around 500 billion uh so uh with so if you look at uh so total three is everything outside so if we're looking at 500 uh billion okay so right. 1.4 uh yeah. Here, I'll give you the total numbers. Out of 1.7. So oh, Bitcoin right now is 940 billion. Uh, Ethereum's 300. So you're looking at oh, uh, just under okay. 1.3. Okay, 1.3. Okay. Just under 1.3. Then you got 500 billion of non-BTC and ETH market cap. That'll take you to around 1.7.
So just to uh, just still to kind of- still blows my mind. It's like I, I've I've accepted um, you know Bitcoin and Ethereum as as financial assets, uh, but still blows my mind as you go down the as you do as you go down the crypto cap scale. Some of these coins that I've never just because I've never heard of them does it doesn't mean anything. But you, you don't know, think the Doge coin worth eleven point five billion dollars making it making equivalent to a lar- equivalent to a large cap stock? I don't think I'll ever get used to the fact that there are just random shit coins that are worth worth the same as a large cap stock. I, well, I don't it's know not a I'll... random shit coin. It's a Bitcoin fork. All right. right. Yeah. I don't think there's anything random about it. It's a it's a, it's a meme coin. It's okay. the meme. It's the meme coin, is it not? Sure, definitely. It's the it's the Lord of the memes. Yeah. yeah. Um. Just let's just uh, just kind of come back to this uh, because I do think it's you know somewhat telling of the market environment. Uh, Biden's uh, Biden's tweeting this weekend. No, no, just perfectly normal. Ignore it. Move right along. I don't know. Oh. Trying to trying to capture the um, trying to draw the line and say we're in, you know, um, uh what like 2021 territory we're in euphoric territory trying to draw that line is a very hard line to draw um because so my best just, friend uh my best it friend can just keep college. going and going and going and going and going my best friend from college uh crashed uh at our house last night uh you know we had people yeah. over for super bowl you know he lives closer to the city so they're like oh we'll just crash so this morning we're talking you know she's asked she's interested she trades all the time so every time we're together she's asking about something so she's like uh jc you know, so what, you know, what do you think about the market? I was like, oh, you know, we're bearish. We're shorting the market. We're betting on lower prices. She's like, I thought people stopped doing that. <laughs> that was, was her exact answer. She's like, really? I thought people stopped doing that. I'm like, well, they did because the stock market went up for 18 months. Uh, but we're doing that now. So I just thought that was an interesting reaction from her. I mean, what I'm seeing a lot of uh, on my social media is um, – a lot of people who are now jumping, who got totally burned on growth stocks, you know, a couple of years ago, and re- I guess really for the last two years, um, and are now jumping back in the pool because they see DraftKings, they see Uber, uh, they see obviously they see you know Meta and, and and Nvidia and AMD and all that crap, but 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 even the even the stocks that that, that got punished a couple of years ago and have come and have come back now. So I'm seeing people, you know, start to be euphoric again. It does not mean we're anywhere near the end of a cycle. I'm just seeing enthusiasm definitely get more positive. Um, just doesn't mean anything. It's not. I can't quantify that, but um, you know. That's just, I, I, I mean, it's hard, to, it, writers, look, it's, hard, it's hard to argue with S&P 5,000, right? It's hard to argue with that. So the S&P's at 5,000. No one's going to argue. No one, I mean, it's just a fact. You can't, I, I mean, it, it's, a, that. it's a nice, it's a and by nice, the way, it's also feather. a fact that uh, almost 60% of the New York Stock Exchange is down for the year. It's a nice feather in the bull's cap though. Um, yeah. If you trade the indexes, perhaps, um, right. and we have put options on those indexes and they're not working to be fair, right. but this, at, at the stock level, which is where institutions live, uh, they're down by the way. So Q's up 6.7% for the year, S and P 500, 5.5% for the year. Uh, Dow Jones industrial average up 2% for the year. And Russell 2000 is down for the year. Uh, also, um, 60 i think it's like 60 about two-thirds of stocks in the russell 2000 are down for the year also uh for those keeping score at home half the s p 500 is down uh, also um these are you know and again i don't last year i i wanted to really try to stay away from year-to-date numbers uh because we had massive rotation in that first week of the year into growth so those numbers were really skewed uh i thought we'd made a good point uh, to remind people of that this year's different because this year, a lot changed, like literally like the last couple of days of the year. So I think this year's year-to-date returns moving forward are actually going to be much more um, indicative of reality versus last year. Well, we had, that, we had that big head fake the first week of the year. I guess it, I guess it would depend on... on uh, what do you mean? The, the market. The in, mean? At, at the index level. What, what do you mean by head fake? You know, we... We went down. <laughs> oh, so you're saying the stock, uh, the the index is sold off at the beginning of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Came back. yeah, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, a little fake. bit. 
Um, yeah, I mean, we were down the first three days of the year, and it's been straight up ever, ever since. So I mean, Pretty much. You know, head fakes, you know, uh, strong, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so those are the things that are on my mind. I think there's some interesting stuff. Uh, by the way, big, big purchase in the Aeon uh, last week. 15, uh, right? 15 million dollars from one of these directors we'll, we'll talk about it now in a minute but i thought that that was that was that was pretty powerful that was a big that was a big purchase we'll talk about it now uh shorting banks on friday spencer how do you feel about that uh i certainly don't want to be buying any banks so yeah if i had to pick a side i would pick on the short side throw slide uh, two up we, we're not going to go over the details of the trade um you know but uh, obviously uh asc members make sure you go check that out but uh this is you know, this is one of the new ones that we've got on. Uh, looks like a big top to me. Uh, this one has been uh, now, this one peaked in February of 2020 and then just started to collapse and just never recovered, never recovered. And now pushing down against, uh, you know, new new mult, you know, lows for the decade, really. Uh, so this is, this is one of our latest positions that we've got on. This was... Um... Were they buying some assets last summer? Were they get getting some distressed assets? What? I don't know the answer to that. I, I if I had were. to guess, I think yes, they because were. those seem to be the ones that are struggling the most. Have you noticed that? Well, those are the ones that popped the most last summer. <laughs> so, right? Uh, uh, NYCB, right? Sure. Uh, yeah. So, because uh, they got signature. PNW, they definitely got, they definitely got some stuff last summer. Definitely. Um, that that would explain the the pop uh, in July. Should but. I be sad? It was the first stock I ever traded. Really? First stock I ever traded was it, it used to be the ticker symbol used to be NYB New York Community Bank, and then they changed it. Oh oh yeah oh that one. yeah no you shouldn't be sad no no who cares? I don't no. know it's kind of like you know it takes me back. No no, no? who cares about like a, a, a who who cares about a regional bank like just in general? Uh, um, there first are... stock you ever traded? You know I shouldn't. Uh, I guess. I mean, I I hold a I hold a, a pang of nostalgia for Under Armour. That was the first like I ever bought. Wow, so, you are young. Well, Under Armour's been around for over a decade now. Um, when, when did Under Armour go public? Under Armour IPO in two thousand five. <laughs> so right, it's been, twenty years ago. It, yeah, twenty years. It, it, it's it's been a minute. It's been a minute. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Uh, okay, so we're, we're gonna have Josh Brown on here in a couple of minutes. Do we want to do? Uh, let's just bring up the, the the calendar for the week uh, here, Alfonso, and then because it is start earnings season, we have a lot. Uh, you know, we're past big tech earnings, but we have a lot of names coming this week. Not so much today. It's oh, great. it's a utility stock. It's not a bank. Sorry, I don't know why. Uh, sorry, it's not. It's a utility stock. It's not a bank. We're thinking about we're thinking about a different name. Oh my God, Pack W. Yeah, it's a utility stock. Wow. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Um, okay. Yeah, we're, we're, we're thinking of Pack W. Bank yeah, is P the other one. We'll, we'll talk about that P later. PNW was the uh PNW was the California wildfire, right? Um that was right. that I think so. Okay. Anyway, uh this is the calendar for the week. As you can see, uh, you know, we're we're past mega cap burning season, but we still have some names. Airbnb, you know, CME, Twilio, Coinbase is Thursday. Thursday is big. Thursday we got DraftKings, Roku, Coinbase, John Deere. Um, a lot of names that interest me. A lot of stocks that may not interest you because they the price action may not, but but companies that are, are interesting nonetheless. Um, so you know, Biogen to Shopify tomorrow. Man, remember Shopify? Uh, the uh, yeah, wow, what you a run it's remember. been on. I I just because it was it was the it was the COVID darling. It was I I think for a while there it was the best performing COVID stock. Um, and then it obviously got crushed and it's come, it's come, it's come way back since then. But, um, yeah, this is where things stand for the week. And then next week is retail earnings. So, and then, and then we're done pretty much. So that's where and we, then, uh, and then we start again. I feel like it's always earnings season. No, no, no. Um, you know, every three months really. Right. So, um, this is where, it yeah, lasts so long. Is it, is correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like it's earnings season more than it isn't. Do I have that right? Um, you know what? It's funny because everyone always talks about the start of earnings season. Nobody ever talks about the end of earnings season. Because it kind of uh, just like there's not like a bell, like a bell they ring. It's kind of like this like slow end. It right? it, it, it it's starts a, again. It, it, it's a slow fade. Um, slow it's fade. it's a slow fade. I would I would argue next week is probably like the the end of of, of earnings season. Um, so whenever you get retail, whenever you get like Nordstroms 
and Macy's and Best Buy. That's the end of, of, of earnings season. So uh, are those the, are those the last ones? Is that really true? Well, like you said, it it's like a trickle, so it never so really get, stops. So you start it never with the really banks, stops. The, the banks are the first ones, then you get like the the tech Super Bowl, where like all the tech stocks are at the same time. You get all excited, right? Bro- remember- broadly speaking, goes banks first, retail last. That's broadly speaking how it goes. So it used uh, to go in alphabetical order back in the day. That's why Alcoa used to always be the first one because the ticker was A. Right, Alcoa. What exactly? And now these days, it, it's it's not. So right. um, I think Zenith Zenith was the last one back in the day. I don't know. Do you ever have a Zenith TV, Spencer? Or are you too young for that? Of course we did. Everybody had a Zenith TV. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. We did, but, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, here. Let me just uh, check on our guests, make sure we're all good. And do you want to do the – oh, oh, you know, actually, real fast, there was one this morning. Let me just hit Monday real fast. Um, stock was down. Um, but the earnings were actually okay. EPS beat, sales beat, guidance was 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 all right. Uh, at least the headlines were. So we're, we're down this morning on Monday, but this is a company that's been public for, what, three years now and is pretty consistently growing the, growing the top and the bottom line uh, every quarter. This so, is the uh, Israeli... This is the this is just like Asana. It's the same business as Asana. It's a it's a project management software. But yes, they are Israeli. I'm into I'm into the Israeli stocks. Clearly, investors are not down eleven and a half percent here pre market. Well, yeah. what, did they, what, what did they come up with a new? I, I didn't, I didn't look closely doing? enough. Um, but again, like at, at a surface headline level, they they came in above estimates. Um, I'm looking at the guidance that they gave, and it looks like it was okay, at least for the at least for the quarter. What about for the year? Um, no, it looks, it looks like, I don't know. It looks okay. So I don't know. I haven't looked too closely into this and I'm probably not going to cause you know, it's monday.com, but no, but that's interesting. You know, it's, it, this isn't November. Yeah. You know, in November we weren't getting these, um, the market is, it, the market environment is different. And we talked about some of these home builders, you know, these consolidations in home builders, how they resolve is going to be really telling. Your Horton already resolved lower, but at the index level, you look at like the XLF, the U.S. Financials Index, consolidating real tight. Indian banks already rolled over. European banks already rolled over. You think American banks are going to hang in there just fine with European banks and Indian banks rolling over? They've been the leading indicator. Um, you know, take a look at those. Indian banks have been the best banks on the planet. Notice how those Indian banks started rolling over before COVID. Before COVID, the Indian banks were already rolling over as the U.S. financials were still making new highs into February. Indian banks had it right then. Do they have it right again? I don't know. Let's ask Josh Brown. What do you say? Should we bring him on? Please. let's, let's, Let's do it. Jay, we've Make been friends it. for a long time. Make the call. I mean, this is pretty professional, guys. Nice uh, nice show you got going here. Hey. All right. uh, are you guys asking me about Indian banks? Because I'm on the wrong show. So I was being facetious. I think we're all here aware that that is the last thing that I would ever ask you about. Uh, but you can't you can't disagree, JB. Indian banks. India, uh, yeah. yeah the, the story with India, it's a flows story. Um, institutional investors have to invest in emerging markets. It's a bucket. It might be 2%. It might be 8%. And none of the flows are going to China. In the meanwhile, uh, India is doing a lot of the right things uh, in, in the eyes of international investors. And it happens to be the pivot of choice for uh, some of the most important companies in America that have become increasingly frustrated with uh, China and Apple is the best example. Me, uh, Tim Tim Cook is constantly in India talking about India, uh, and a, and a lot of other big tech companies are are making noises about selling in India, uh, hiring in India, building in India. So that's a it's it's an ETF flows story, and then it's also like a political it's it's a political story. When you come um, to India, when you come in India with me, yo, we have a good time. No, I have Crohn, I have Crohn's disease. I can't even eat the food here. I, I'm not I'm not an adventurous traveler. I don't go to Mexico anymore. Um, but can I say one thing about the earnings season, guys? Sure. Go for it. it. It's 
it was invented. It it's not a real thing that ever existed up until the last 20 years. It's a TV, it's a it's a it's a TV concept. Um so like the way companies reported earnings in the 90s, some of them had conference calls, some of them didn't. Like it just you just put you you have an the SEC requires that your numbers come out within 45 days of the end of the quarter. So if you're a public company with more than $75 million in market cap, like in 2002, they tightened up this requirement. And then all of a sudden, like it became a thing to watch for. But Is that it wasn't true. I didn't realize yeah. it's 45 days. That's a fun fact. 45 days. So that's why that's why earnings season, that's why these companies are all clumped together because they're all trying to get in during this um during this deadline. So yeah, but like things like like Exxon and Chevron report the same day. Because if yeah. they didn't, they're going to be moving based on the other one and stuff like that. So that's probably pretty strategic. Yes. And then like the, the tech companies report at four o'clock because that's 1 p.m. in California. You wouldn't want to hear from these people at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of things that just like sprung about and then it became it just became the conventions of earnings season. But there is a beginning. There is an end. And it's based on how quickly companies were expected to get their numbers out inside of that window. There's a reason the financials go first. It would be pretty embarrassing if a financial company weren't ready to close its books and report results immediately. Think about how necessary that is for confidence of like a bank's customers. Hold on, let me so ask there, you this. There's a rhyme and reason for a lot of this stuff. What about Uncle Warren dropping it on Saturdays? It's pretty gay. Well, that's why he's that's why he's he's begoted forever. He doesn't do a conference call. And he drops the report on Saturday when he hopes as few people are paying attention as possible. <laughs> and if he sees somebody reacting to a quarterly earnings report of his, he looks at that person as not really a shareholder and doesn't really care how they feel. So yep. it's a it's a vibe. And I love it's it. Pretty, it's pretty gangster. Let me ask you this. So, Josh, four point two billion in assets last I uh, checked. Is that right? Uh, yes. That's what Barry that said is. the other day. Congratulations. It's a big number. That that it, yeah, it, it moves a bunch, but as of our last, we have to just go by the filing number. Of course. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, as you can as you can tell, I have some salt and pepper in the beard, and uh, it certainly it certainly wasn't uh, dropped on me. I had to I had to assemble this incredible team that I have, and we had to figure it out. But uh, so far, so good. As a as a you know as a financial advisor and somebody you know. You, Talk to clients, you know, you, you you guys deal with clients, like your whole team, obviously, not just yourself. Like, how do you think about this emerging market thing and the bifurcation between, kind of to circle back on this conversation, you know, you've got India doing what they're doing. You've got China doing the exact opposite. you got Brazil somewhere in the middle. You know, I feel like back in the day, in the early 2000s, it was more of like emerging markets. Now it's yeah. like very different between one to the next and stuff like that. Like, how do you think about that bigger picture? So, so the truth is like most of these countries should not be slammed together into an investable concept because they are very idiosyncratic. Even if you go back to the 2000s decade, JC, where you and I began our careers uh, for the most part, like when they were talking about the BRICS countries, yeah. it became a thematic, like the way people trade Kathy Wood stuff now, like mm -hmm. it, Thematics are what's driving the market right now. So back then, the biggest theme was BRICS. And the idea was Brazil, Russia, India, China had like these common characteristics of a burgeoning middle class and an ever greater drive toward capitalism and consumerism and that they were all going to be mini versions of America. And obviously, it didn't play out that way. But even that conceit made no sense when you consider the fact that one of the primary drivers of emerging market uh, country stock markets uh, historically has been commodities. And think about it. Within the BRICS, two of them are commodity exporters. Two of them are commodity importers. Yeah. India has no commodities. China has some, but they have, they have to import all their energy. Um, it's the opposite with Brazil and Russia. They are massive energy and commodity exporters. So wh why are we looking at the four of these? as though th their their futures are going to somehow look similar to each other. And of course, they didn't. So for better or for worse, Americans get access to overseas stock markets via these kind of these kind of groupings that have come about because I guess indexers have to classify things by something. 
And it doesn't make sense for a U.S. investor to buy 50 different country uh, ETFs at a 0.25% weighting of a portfolio. But you made a good point, Josh. You made a good point on the weightings, right? So if you look at EEM, if you look at materials and energy, materials and energy combined is half the weighting of technology. This is an EEM. Now, if you go to EMXC, which is Emerging Markets X China, it's somehow even more egregious where you have, when you add up materials and energy, you still have twice the energy exposure of materials and energy combined, even X China. So both, it's just, it's not what it used to be, like you said, where emerging markets were more commodity based. It's it's another tech trade. Yeah, and I think we also, all of us, uh, myself included, we have a tendency to forget that it's human beings sitting in committees who are creating these indices, and they're not just picking which countries to smash together. They're picking which companies in which countries and how to weight them. And it's not science. So they make decisions that, well, this, co this, this country has state-owned enterprises or state-operated enterprises or SOEs. Um, and it happens to be that the largest three telecoms in this country are de facto government institutions. Or it happens to be that the state-owned oil company is the biggest company in this country, even though politicians control how profitable it's able to be and what it can sell and where it can operate. Are those really stocks or are they more like or are they more like bonds or some sort of a preferred government security? I don't know, but they're the only thing sizable enough in that country to include it in an index. And so somebody makes that decision and you could end up owning an ETF that's loaded with like quasi government institutions that only operate as companies because they have ticker symbols trading. But in real life, they're like a, a branch of, of a, you know, of, of, of a parliament. Yeah, that's why what so. Perth is doing is really cool. Um, and she's outperforming every other emerging market ETF, right? Perth yeah. is the, uh, the, it's like the, um, like the non freedom, freedom indexes, yeah. freedom you index. Know, right? what, what's cool with what Perth's doing. It, she didn't, I don't think she predicted this. Perth's idea was that we can weight a portfolio of emerging markets by how much freedom exists in those countries and not subjectively. There are quantitative indices that look at the degree of freedom that the average citizen in these countries experiences from all different dimensions, freedom of where to educate your children, freedom of religion, freedom of uh, the ability, you know, the ability to vote, um, how capitalist uh, a society is, et cetera. And so she, so that was the idea, but what it happened to have predicted was that over longer stretches of time, countries that have more freedom should have better results for investors. The problem is it doesn't work that way every year. So you could well, have a year working that way since she launched. <laughs> it's yes. So, so she got the big picture, right. And it's really cool. And I have so much respect for you know what she said, Josh? In launching you know what she this said? product. I thought this was so good. And and it goes to other aspects of life. You know what she said? She said the reason I launched the ETF was because this ETF needed to exist. Right? Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, I want to launch an ETF. So let's figure out what ETF we could raise a lot of money for. No, it was the, the other way around. It was like this ETF needs to exist. Let's make it happen. It's a pain in the ass. She I've had plenty of conversations with her. Some countries are more of a pain in the ass than other countries. Some countries she avoids altogether because it's too hard, right? Like she's done the work and have so much respect for that. You know, you, you hear Morgan Housel saying things like, I wrote the book because this book had to exist. You know, the new Chris Dixon book, he wrote the book because it had to exist. Like this needed to be out there. Your first book, I would put in that same category too. Correct me if I'm oh, wrong. You. you wrote that book because it had to exist. No, it was it was bursting out of my chest cavity like the alien uh, from the movie. Uh, but yeah, the other thing with Perth is she was really struggling to. So everyone that she pitched the idea loved the idea, but the pro but building the product was you know the part that she struggled with. And when she met Wes Gray and Jack and the team at Alpha Architect, that was like the unlock because those guys knew how to get an ETF trading and they understood how to um, facilitate like the start of a product existing. So that was, I think that was really a, a pivotal moment for her. And uh, I just, when she crossed a hundred million, I was like, I had a tear in my eye. 
I was so proud of her. So she's way she's way past that now. Where is she now? Seven hundred million, bro. Seven hundred. Good for Rolling. her. Yeah, dude. Shout out Perth. Good for her. Um, let, let's let's bring it back home here. Um, election year. Uh, just want to hear your thoughts. I know you you know you and I we've laughed about this for twenty years. We don't want to necessarily overthink the election in terms of markets. Uh, but Biden uh, going ham this weekend on the Twitter. I don't know if you saw. Uh, Spencer, why don't you throw up the first tweet uh, where uh, Biden is talking about how strong the stock market is. This is a uh, Saturday afternoon. Good news for folks as we start the weekend. The stock market is going strong as a sign of confidence in America's economy. This is someone who's never, ever tweeted about the stock market. Uh, so Biden's intern tweeting out about the market. Any Any thoughts there from a sentiment standpoint, Josh? Yeah, this is not his idea. This is definitely not something that that he wants to be doing. I doubt it's him doing it. Um, but uh, I so all right. I think three things. Number one, this is really a Trump rally, and everyone's just buying stocks because they know Trump is coming. At least that's what I heard from the other side. <laughs> so that so <laughs> it's a stealth Trump rally. So that's stealth one Trump rally. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Like in real life, obviously, this is this is. The market's been rallying for three and a half years, waiting for uh, envisioning uh, the 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 re uh, right 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 the, the re-election. Sure, sure. Okay, fine. Uh, so there's that. The second thing is, uh, I guess if you're the president and you have a stock market that that looks like this, you should. I mean, your job is to get reelected. If you believe in the policies that you're trying to put in place, then use use anything at your disposal. If the stock market were down forty percent, I think it's up twenty six percent from October. If we're down, if we're down twenty six percent since last October, like it's not like his his political opponents wouldn't be using it against him. True. <laughs> so right. you know, I, I don't. I guess I guess it's nice that he acknowledges that the stock market exists. I don't think the stock market going higher is a particularly big legislative uh, objective <laughs> for his uh, for for his side of the aisle. Uh, but I think I guess they'll take it. Yeah, At this I mean, point, listen, it'll take whatever they can get. Listen, if this was Trump who tweeted about the market every day, it's like the boy that crawled, cried wolf. It wouldn't matter. This is a little out of character, so it sort of stood out. And speaking of out of, out of character, what about the one last night during the Super Bowl? I don't know if you saw this, Josh. I know you're not not too much I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on days. Twitter. I don't really but you know. you got to see this one. This was during the Super Bowl. No, it, 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 it was after the joke. Account. It was afterwards. It was, yeah, afterwards. It was after the yeah. Super Bowl. Yeah. Okay. No, I like – listen, I like this stuff because you – it's madness no matter what it's mad so the the conspiracy theory that taylor swift is somehow involved in the rigging of the super bowl because it's going to help Biden. you have if you don't play into it and, and you don't wink at it then the other team just continues to to get the the w so if this is the world that we live in now where memes matter and spread faster than actual news then i guess you got to play the game Biden, I'm all, Biden I'm okay with the with laser it. eyes, Bitcoin turned on a dime. As soon as Biden laser eyes come out, Bitcoin turns around, dollar starts to rally. Coincidence? <laughs> Maybe. Perhaps. <laughs> all right. Um, I thought that was fun. I wanted to hear your thoughts. So no thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, what about this? No, my, th breath? my thought is I, my thought is I don't I don't mind it at all. Dark <laughs> I, I'm a, I'm I'm okay encourage. with dark Brandon. I'm okay right. with dark Brandon. So uh eight percent uh so far. Uh, sorry, excuse me, 6.7% so far for 2024 for the Qs, 6.7%. S&P, 5.5% uh, so far. Uh, uh, almost 60% of the stocks in the New York Stock Exchange are down this year. Uh, Two-thirds of the stocks in the Russell 2000 are down this year. Half the S&P 500 is down this year. Um, the percentage of stocks in the New York Stock Exchange above their 200-day moving average, uh, down to December lows, making new multi-month lows as we speak. Percentage of stocks above their 50-day on the New York, uh, lowest since November. Um, this is as the indexes uh, made new all-time highs last week. Any thoughts on this, uh, on, on, on market breath? How do you think about this? So I was reading Nick Colas this morning, and the truth is this has not been a great earnings season, um, to, to go back to what we started talking Who's about. Who's Nick Colas? I don't, I don't know this gentleman. Uh, Nick is the founder of a research firm called DataTrek. Prior to that, he had been a chief strategist at several firms. And prior to that, he was an analyst working for Steve Cohen at SAC. And I consider him to be one of the brightest people on Wall Street. 
Cool. And I've been very influenced by his research over the years. Cool. Nick uh, points out that Q4 U.S. earnings season thus far rates a C minus. The revenue earnings beat percentages are running around the long run averages, but the beat amounts themselves are well below average. Um, and I haven't I haven't looked much deeper, but it's important. By the to way, understand Josh, that, don't don't the C students uh, C students are the ones that hire the A students, right? Yeah. Isn't that how that works? I don't know if we get credit for that though during earnings season. So so you know Nick's pointing out that this is happening in the context of a market that's just run up 30% on, on hopes of rate cuts and the gradual realization amongst most economists that the recession missed us. So that run up does make sense, but now you have a very, you have a very, uh, I wouldn't say overvalued per se, but a highly valued stock market relative to history and a not so hot earnings season. And, you know, apart from the AI story, to, to what you were pointing out earlier before I joined the stream, it's not as though the whole world is booming. Um, you know, we had this really great rally in Q4, as you pointed out on our show in early January, and that's great. And it's not like we've given the whole thing up, but you know, all of that happened based on this idea that we were getting toward the end of tightening. Um, but so now what? Hopefully, it's earnings growth, but we're not really seeing. Oh, here's that so let me let me add growth. to that. So. You make an interesting point that markets rallying in hopes of lower rates, but the U.S. ten-year yield went out on Friday at new multi-month. I don't highs. think it's uh, so. Let me let me back up. I don't necessarily think it's hopes of lower rates. I think it's the end of the hiking cycle is probably been the the bigger benefit. But then why is so, the bond market getting the shit kicked out of it? Right. What do you mean? Well, I mean, I'm I mean, I'm with you, right? The, the stock market did very well oh, as well, interest the, rates yeah. were coming off. But now interest Listen, rates are making new multi-month highs. You, you understand, six months ago, Jamie Dimon was talking about 7% interest rates. So, like, wasn't all Santoli, of that stuff is, Wasn't Santoli talking, or Santelli? No, definitely not Santoli. Santelli talking about 15%? <laughs> right, but so but but f f forget about Santelli. Jamie Dimon is eff effectively like represents bank leadership. Like he is the thought leader amongst financial institutions, maybe oh. worldwide. Not everyone agrees with him, but everyone listens to him. He hates Bitcoin, he, bro. But he, he but he was contemplating the necessity uh, of 7% of rates. Six months before that, he was talking about a hurricane uh, for, for the economy. So like that thinking started to fade away in the last three months. And that's the main thing that's changed. So I don't, the rate cuts, whether we're, we, we were pricing in seven, now we're pricing in three, and the market's gone up. So the, the rate cuts themselves haven't really been that important. It's the end of the hikes, to me, that's really the thing. So to answer your question in an elliptical way, why are, why are rates getting destroyed? I mean, well, it's rates because of- bonds destroyed. Yeah, right. Why are bonds getting destroyed? I, I think like we just have these unrealistic expectations of how many rate cuts. And then all of a sudden everyone started to feel much better that maybe we don't need that many anyway. And that's the story of January into early February. And now maybe that's being rethought a little bit. Um, I've never made money betting on rates and I probably, I, I probably won't be able to uh, this time around either. So I don't like, I don't have any trades put on based on what I think they do in March. Throw slide just, 10, throw slide 10. Well, as you know, we follow the bond market very closely. And uh, stocks and bonds, remember back in the day, JB, stocks and bonds used to trade inversely. Bonds yes. were a safe haven. And over the last couple of years, that has shifted um, where stocks and bonds have been trading together. Um, uh, so here we're looking at uh, copper making new multi-month lows, uh, bonds rolling over as the s and is going higher. So I, I, you know, I ask myself a lot of questions. I ask questions to people on Twitter. Is, is the correlation now back to the way it used to be in stocks and bonds are trading inversely again, or or do bonds and, and copper have this right? Uh, and you're seeing it at the breath level, uh, at the individual stock level, where you know over half the stocks in the New York Stock Exchange are down, half the S&P is down this year. All these things are following bonds and copper uh, and interest rates, and, and it's the S&P and the NASDAQ that are the last ones going up because tech stocks have held in okay, you know, to me, like these divergences really stand out. You know, something's got to give. I think. Uh, yeah, it's possible. Look, I, I think, I think that uh, you have been spot on looking at the dollar 
as the thing that when it heats up too much always p- becomes a, a wall that the stock market runs right into. Um, and I have enough trouble following a few uh, intermarket analyses like that. So I, you know, I don't really follow copper futures. I'm not really looking for those signals. I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm saying they would elude my, my, uh, my field of vision. The bigger thing that I, the bigger thing that I look at is reactions to earnings, reactions to earnings beats, and trying not to take anecdotes, pile them all up, and say, "Hey, look, it's data." You know, I'm, I'm trying to just like get a better idea of what the bigger picture says. And this has been. Uh, reaction wise, this has been a pretty good earnings season. You've had a few notable companies get destroyed, but overall, like we're higher from where it started. And most importantly, the financials, the banks uh, didn't let us down. So if you think that changes in Q2, maybe you change your view. Uh, for for right this moment, I don't think that that changes. Um, one of the most interesting things that I think comes out of uh, the first half of this year I'm assuming by the by by June 1st, uh, or excuse me, by June 30th, we will have experienced at least one rate cut. How do markets react? Because historically, the unwind of a rate hike cycle and the unwind of an inverted yield curve, historically, those things have been precursors to uh, volatility. But didn't we get that? But didn't we get that already, Josh? In 22, late 21, did we? Did we get what? that volatility that decline like all those things like you know the market's forward looking like people are looking for yeah, this recession still- the crack we these tech stocks like metal was down like 80 percent or something ridiculous like these things yeah got the guy crash. that got this right jc the guy that got this right is ed yordani and what he predicted was no broad recession but rolling mini recessions that went sector by sector and that's exactly what played out you had a a, a very short-term housing market recession where homes wouldn't move and prices, you know, corrected and the mortgage guys got killed. Okay. That took place. You had a, you had a, a regional bank panic that the fed was able to subvert in a weekend. You had a tech stock market crash that took place in 22, the largest cap technology and communications companies all corrected 30 to 70%. Um, so you had the, the, the complete incineration of the IPO and SPAC market, which still hasn't recovered. So you did have these rolling cor- corrections. You had them in oil stocks. So I think like your Denny is, is really the guy right now. And you know, what he's saying going forward is that they're really, it, 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 if you're not focused on the consumer as the number one thing, you're missing the, the, the story. And so many of our indicators don't focus directly on the consumer. They focus on finished consumer goods. So like the leading economic indicator, the LEI that everybody talks about, month after month after month after month, it would keep falling and they would keep doubling and tripling down on their inflation calls, uh, on their, excuse me, on their recession calls. And Ed would point out, do you even know what's in this? Because if you did, you would understand that most of this stuff is involved in goods. The whole economy has transitioned to services. We did all the spending on goods. That's why the LEI looks recessionary, but the real economy doesn't. So he's one of the guys that I focus on because he actually knows what's in the indicators. He was around when they first invented some of these things. <laughs> so back to, out, Eddie Ardini. L- back little, to earnings season, little though. Little low I'm blow from, there. Little low blow. No big deal. No, I'm from a time when I remember when there was no such thing as earnings season. By so way, I watched is, is the whole thing get put together. Is leading economic indicator one of the best oxymorons on Wall Street? It's one of my favorites. Yeah, well, it doesn't work. No, it literally doesn't work. It's got like nine components and there's some value in each of them to understand what's going on, but they're not leading anything. All right. I got, Complete, I got completely I got, wrong. I got three quick. I want to talk about something important before the fun police comes in and kicks you out. This is forget all that stuff. Now we're going to get down to real business. All right. Five boroughs. Long Island's not one of them. So five boroughs. Okay. Best pizza in New York City. Any of the five boroughs. Go one. You get one. Well, wait, we can't just say pizza. We've yes, done this before. This is my no, show. And when we do your show, we do it your saying way. Like, this is my show. Like pizza, like period? Pizza, period. One pizza, right. any borough. So if I can only have one slice, yes. where I can only get a pie, right? Yes. Uh, you for, can do a slice or a pie. Either one goes. So, yes. so for me, it's Joe's. And there are six of them in Manhattan, and I'll take any, I'll take from any any location. That's to me is the quintessential 
New York no, slice. Any, any, any suggestion on a location? Where do you go? Uh, there's, there's one in financial district. Uh, there's one by my office on 41st and it's on 41st and 7th or 41st and Broadway. Um, but there's, there's, I think there's six of them now. And it's more but, of a classic slice. It's a, it's a classic it's, slice, right? It's like, if somebody says, give me a New York slice yeah. and I hand you a paper plate with a Joe's slice on it, you take a bite, you say, Oh fuck yeah! That's this is one of this is one of the ones that's you fold. Pizza. You fold it right. It's one of those. It's not oh, like yeah. a, it's not like a Prince Street Square. You have to eat it on the paper plate, and you must eat it walking. Yes, got it. You have to. We're, we're standing. All you right, do not ready? sit down with a slice from Joe's. One steak, Manhattan. One steak, Manhattan. Go. One steak. Oh, uh, Fort Charles. Prime rib for sure. Wow, Fort yeah. Charles. I went there yeah, with you. Yeah, for sure. That was a good right spot. now, it changes. But right, like, like if I could, if, if if someone's like, hey, let's do steak anywhere you want. That's probably where I want to go. Um, you, you know where you in, and I, if you can get it. You in. and I haven't been to Monkey Bar yet. It's the same owner. I heard. I heard. I can't that. get a I, anytime. I only want a table on Thursdays because that's the only night I'm ever out. Wow. I I just I don't know anybody there, and I just can't get a table. It's so annoying. It's I heard so it's annoying. Easy. I heard it's easier to get a table there than the others. No, I'm sure it is. It's like three Just times not on the size. But I, I don't know if you remember. You and I used to go to Monkey Bar all the time under yes, prior ownership. Around the corner from that other bar. What was it called? Uh, it's in the like it's in the fifties. It's like people used to like Scott Wapner's book party was there. It's like a, it's like a giant thing. Anyway, they got they got like re they got like bought and redone by the group that owns. Um, o Cheval yeah, and Four Charles. So there's, I, from what I hear, a lot of your favorite things from O Cheval. It's like you can kind of get them at Monkey. Well, Burger. I was going to ask you. My next question was best burger in Manhattan. Is that and where you're going to go with again? O Cheval, which I know is. Listen, I know that's a Chicago thing. It's not a New York thing, but okay, it's okay. It's just so. It's just that cheeseburger with the egg on top, and it's like it's and like the bacon. bacon, and the bacon. And, it's just ridiculous. Ridiculous. There's nothing. So there's nothing in New York that you could bite into and not be like, and not be like, oh my God, this is incredible. All right, last one. Last one. This one's near and dear to your heart. Best bagel in Manhattan. Not uh, Long bagel, Island, not this Long yeah, Island. Manhattan. Bagels in Manhattan. Bagels in Manhattan are not so good. Stop it. Yeah, Bro Brooklyn, Queens, Long that? Island. Brooklyn, Queens, Long Island, better bagels. Are you really going to pull that card right now? Yeah. And actually, and the, yeah. What, what are you gonna yeah, say, Bagel Boss? Oh, you can I, Bagel Boss? Let me give a shout out to the major food group, though. Um, because last week, uh, you know, uh, Michael Sonnenshine from uh, Grayscale? No. All right. Went out to lunch with uh, Michael and uh, went to Sidell's. And Sidell's is like the upscale bagel restaurant owned by major food group, which a lot of your is that chat a thing? Knows owns upscale Carbone. bagel restaurant? Is that allowed? Yeah, dude. 20 it's a $25 plate of some of the best locks I've ever had in my life. Okay. In incredible. And like uh, a wooden stick, they just drop toasted bagels on. You know what I mean? Like a tower of yeah, yeah, toasted yeah, yeah. bagels. Yep. Locks, sable, whitefish. Forget about it. All right. That's the, mo that's the move. That's the move. This was the more important conversation that I wanted to have with you. So double doubling down on the Oshaval guys. Doubling down on that. Big, I, they that just, big they, shot out. Big shot they out. Make, they make a... Uh, they make incredible, uh, incredible cheeseburger. Good for that, uh, Josh. For them. Before, before I let you go, you have a book coming out, right? Later on this year, you wrote another no. book. No no? No no, 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 no. All right, fine. No, but it's, that, it's just that there's so many books coming out from Ritholtz Wealth Management that they just yeah. assume Josh is one I, of them. I would tell you, uh, Nick Majuli just sold his 200th copy of Just Keep Buying. One, perhaps one of the most helpful 200 uh, intelligent I, I investing books somewhere. ever written. Yeah, I have a copy and, back uh, here. Somewhere. It's, I mean, the book is just, it's the truth. No matter what happens in the market, never stop buying. If you're a young person, not if you're like 80 and you will win. And he document, it's not a theory with, without backup. He documents this meticulously as only Nick Majuli can do. And if you haven't read that book yet, buy that. I think he yeah. sold more than 200 copies, Josh. 200,000 copies. Thought so. Did I say two hundred? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I, I also, I, I also want to promote this book, Josh. I I loved this book, by the way. Fan, Thank fantastic. You. Oh, fantastic I appreciate job. it. Yeah, yeah, great job. So I wrote that with uh, I wrote that with Brian Portnoy four yeah. years four years ago. 
Brian did a lot of the, the harder work of making sure each chapter was edited to perfection, but we had some great contributing writers and it's mostly all, I think it's all financial advisors who are talking about what they do with their own portfolios, myself included. So, uh, that was a lot of fun to work on that project. Not that much writing for me. So that was one of the easier, right. uh, things I've done. Josh, uh, your first book, I think you published it, what, 2010, 11, nine? No. 20, it came out, I wrote it in 11. It came out in 2012. How, uh, how backstage, relevant backstage do you think Wall it is? Street. How, how relevant do you think it is today? Uh, cause if what, from what I remember, most of it is still right. Well, everything I predicted would happen in the industry happened. Like it was incredible. It was, it was incredible how, how prescient the book was. And at the time I didn't feel as confident that what I was saying was really going to happen. It was almost like, this is what should happen. Like, so I was talking about like, what, like, how does the conflicted stockbroker become the fiduciary advisor? And how does that remake the industry as more and more reformed brokers, um, you know, go through what I had gone through and, uh, yeah, but all those, all those, all those, um, visions of what would happen in the industry. It's exactly how things would play out like to a T. Josh, I, I read that book last summer and it was just funny how quaint some of the ETF stuff was because back then, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was very, very quaint. <laughs> We've come a long I way think when I wrote the book, there were like a hundred ETFs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, that's yeah, a new book. Yeah. That's the next book. It's all ETFs. <laughs> right, right. All right. Uh, we'll let Josh run. Uh, thank Josh, you, Josh. Thank, thanks it. a lot for coming on. Uh, hey, I love you guys. Sunday. Thanks so much for having me. All right. That was good. That was great. Wow, yeah. hating on Manhattan bagels, man. I don't know, man. I don't know if I, I don't know if I agree with. I, 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 I think Island he meant. I, I, th I think he meant the chain Manhattan bagels sucks. <laughs> the no, what, there is a chain in Manhattan bagels, and they and oh, they wow, do wow, suck. Wow, wow. <laughs> no, but he's you know he's biased to Long Island, and I have a lot of friends yeah. from Long Island. I get him. By the way, I've had Long Island bagels, and they are fantastic. And where I live, the bagels suck. We've got yeah. too many Gentiles where I live. The bagels are is very is really disappointing. I gotta buy the bagels. I gotta bring them home. I gotta retoast them. I gotta oh. order. I gotta order double the cream cheese. Put my own schmear on. Like I, I gotta redo the whole thing. I mean, I, I'll do it, but like I shouldn't have to. Yeah, or just don't eat. Uh, yeah, black coffee, no bagels, right, JC? Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, right, that's, that's right. Phil Perlman. Uh, right, 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 right. My, my okay. daughter likes to go get bagels with daddy, so we go. Okay. You know? Okay. All right, uh, let's do a couple, let's do a couple of things headlines, and then we'll um, hot corner. Uh, I wanted to talk uh, Diamondback Energy uh, Fang. This is uh, over the weekend, actually. Uh, this, this news broke from the journal. They're merging with Endeavor. This is a a fifty-ish billion dollar merger happening. Um, so Endeavor is a private company, but this is a Couple of Permian Basin giants merging here, so uh, it's a stock and cash deal. So and Endeavor's private, so there's really no trade to be made on this. But uh, just wanted to bring that out there because Diamondback is merging with a company, basically the same size. Uh, you know, these companies are kind of the same size as, as each other. So there was that. Um, I came in this morning and I saw Rivian trading down. They caught a downgrade. So uh, from Barclays, not that I care too much about that, but Rivian down five percent. I thought that was interesting. Uh, we talked about Monday.com already, and uh, hey, um, you know who did some selling last week? Um, JC is Mr. Jeff Bezos, sold about twelve million shares of Amazon last week. He, uh, I mean, how relevant is that for him? Not, no, not, not that it's relevant. not. It's not relevant. It's two billion dollars. That's like yeah. chump. That's pocket change. But um, you know, and, and and we don't really care about sales anyway, um, as a general rule. But you know, none, nonetheless, interesting. Um, and that's all I had, really, as far as far as headline goes, it's, or headlines go. It's, it's, it's you know, it's a Monday morning, so it's pretty quiet out there, and and uh, that's that's what I got. Uh, um, let's hit, let's hit the hot corner because there's a big transaction here. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. So hot right now. So one of the emails that I love receiving first thing in the morning is uh, the hot corner. And uh, oh, my I, lordy, I was coming out of the shower this morning and I, I, I got alerted that the uh, hot corner was delivered. By the way, drop the link. If you're not getting the daily hot corner, like, what are you thinking? Like, these are the most important transactions that are made in the market on the prior day. In this case, Friday, right? Because today's Monday. 
and um, it's free. Uh, so, you know, if you don't want to do the work because it's a pain in the neck, I certainly don't, which is why we built this damn thing because I don't want to do the work. Uh, you know, there's a combination of machines and humans uh, that come to this because sometimes the most important part of the SEC filing is in the footnotes, like in the 27th footnote. Uh, yeah. Warren Buffett is uh, notorious for that sort of thing. Uh, Carl Icahn, too. Um, they, they know all the tricks in the book. Unfortunately, Straza uh, has worked at these big hedge funds, so... Uh, he used to be the one executing some of these tricks. Uh, so he knows he knows where to find them. He knows where the bodies are buried in these filings. So uh, Stras has done a really good job over the years of helping us uh, sort of cipher through what, what matters and what doesn't, as opposed to just getting like a water hose of every filing when the majority of them don't matter at all. These are open market transactions. This gentleman right here, he's a director at Aon, uh, Mr. Lester B. Knight. And this particular gentleman just dropped 16 milli. That is not a, pike, not a piker purchase. Not a piker purchase at all. Throw up a slide two here so you can see uh, what Aon has done. These reinsurance companies, I got to tell you, man, Marsha McLennan, Aon, these guys are just printing money, uh, have for a long time, you know, line, line go up. Um, really, really fascinating to see. Something I will add to this um, uh, is that, you know, these European financials are loaded up with these insurance stocks and European financials already started uh, rolling over uh, with um, with uh, Indian financials as well. Uh, so I just want to uh, put that caveat there. But man, bigger picture, you know, when we talk about making a shopping list uh, to see like around, you know, around uh, St. Patrick's Day, mid-March, you know, perhaps post rug pull, if, if, if one actually comes at the index level, you know, post seasonally weak period going into a seasonally strong period into the election you know i'm thinking about these sorts of names right these you know when you're making your shopping list so i encourage everybody out there have a shopping list if and when you do get a market correction after such a massive run-up uh since october um these are the types of names i'm going to be interested in accumulating so something to keep an eye on aon shout out aon shout out marsh mcclendon yeah, the entire insurance space, as we've talked about, because they can they they have they have pricing power. They can just raise prices. Everyone's insurance is going through the roof of all of all different kinds: uh, car insurance, auto insurance, uh, the same thing, home insurance. Right? It, it, they're all all going up, and um, there's really nothing you can do about it. So, yeah. Uh, another it. interesting uh, one. Uh, do you have the uh, New York Community uh, Bank Corp? um chart do we have that up or do i need to drop it i i don't know do we do we have that chart funds first stock i ever bought uh so if that ever becomes a trivia question what was the first stock jc ever bought new york community bank corp um yep. you know who we told have it, me we have it right here uh, you know who told me to buy that stock um fun fact you know who told me to buy that stock josh brown Warren, the one Warren buffett who, oh. nope uh josh brown was the one who uh told me to buy that stock back in 2004 um so new york community uh, bank Corp. Like, yeah so like this was the so this is a combination of purchases only eight hundred thousand dollars between the president of mortgage the president of banking and uh three directors the ceo coo we, we've we've discussed this though steve this is like this is like them showing the market that they that they they support the bank but if right? you're gonna do that at least buy something meaningful between all these people, they can only fork over 800 grand like that. That is not a vote of confidence. That is let's let's pretend that we're trying to uh, right. Like they that's like a 800 grand, dude. That's all you guys could come up with all of you together. Uh, I'm sure that number was discussed ad nauseum. <laughs> what would the number be? I mean, that who, is... want, who wants to throw down? All right. Um, like this they were all asking each a, other, like, come on, can you throw up a little bit more? Let's get it to a million. And they couldn't even get it to a million. Like, man, that is not a vote of confidence. This reminds me, uh, over the weekend, I, I was uh, re-watching uh, Too Big to Fail. I haven't seen it in a very long time. And there's that scene where, where all the heads of all the big banks are in the room together. And they're trying to figure out who wants... Um, uh, uh, Lehman's toxic assets, and they're like, all right, and and the, the you know, uh, one blank line of Goldman goes, all right, I'm in for a billion. 
<laughs> and then they go around the table and they go, all right, who, who who's in to buy, to buy this crap? And they all have to throw down, right? Um, and that's kind of what I feel like that was happening here. You get the brain trust in the room. All right, we have to, we have to buy our stock. I'm in for X. Who's with me? The best part of that whole thing, to me, the funniest part is during long-term capital management back in 98, stock market's falling apart. They have an emergency meeting back in 98 to save the market because the when you put some Nobel Prize winners and, and give them a ton of money, they they make the market blow up. So lesson learned. Yeah. Um, mm. You know, uh, being smart and winning Nobel Prizes does not translate into good market returns. As it turns out, it's the exact opposite. They were too smart for their own good. Well, it worked. It worked until it didn't, right? right. As, as they always do. So by definition, right. didn't work. And uh, right. so <laughs> they had an emergency meeting on a Sunday. The CEOs of all the banks, everybody comes together. Bear Stearns didn't show up, right? Bear Stearns said, it doesn't matter. So everybody came in except for Bear Stearns. They saved the market, right? right? Uh, there's a book called When Genius Failed. Yep. And, you know, they saved the market. And then what happens later in 2008? Bear Stearns, the first to go. No mm -hmm. bailout. See ya. Do you think that's a coincidence? Nope. Nope. I don't think so. Nope. Nobody came to their rescue. <laughs> nope. Nobody came to their rescue. They remember. Yeah. To me, that's the funniest, you know, the irony there. Uh, the first one to go was Bear Stearns. As soon as they had the opportunity to say, see ya, see ya. Uh, they yep. said, see ya. Thanks. Thanks for uh, not showing up. What was that, a decade earlier? I thought that was not. To me, yep. that's the funniest part of the whole story. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, one hole. Uh, great movie. Uh, all star cast. I, I love HBO, does or I don't know if they still do, but they used to do these movies where you know, these HBO original movies where they would just make sort of like a TV movie about some uh, based on some book, based on some event. You know, they did one about the crisis, they did one about the the uh, the election in 2000, and they all have like these all star casts, and they're all. They're all really good. I'm a big fan of that stuff. Anyway, uh, guys, get the hot corner. It's free. It goes out every single morning. I'll drop the link uh, on the screen. It's also in the chat below, though. So um, can't recommend that enough. Uh, we do the work for you there. Um, so you don't even have to dig through fire links. If that's if that's not your bag, we we, we do it. We do it. Um, so easy peasy. Uh, okay. We we have uh, we have Sam here from uh, from the research desk. We can bring him on in a minute. What is the is there anything else we wanted to hit on? Let me look at my list. I don't think there was. I have. A, I just wanted to show this chart quickly. Uh, let's go to uh, slide two here because um, I do have the chart handy. Uh, just to kind of give everyone some perspective on this thing. Uh, how about that, huh? Uh, and and fun fact, uh, this uh, wow. Bear Stearns peaked in January of 07. So by the time the S&P 500 peaked, uh, in October of 07, this thing was already uh, making new 52-week lows. So uh, when you talk about how this came out of nowhere, <laughs> no, it did not, right? I, I'm I'm very impressed you actually are able to get that data. That um... Of course. What do you think this is? I don't know. I don't know. It's hard. Sometimes it's hard to get, like, delisted data. Um... Uh, yes, it is. Uh, shout out Optima. For those of you guys wondering uh, where we get uh, a lot of our stuff, Optima does a great job. Uh, these guys are great. I reached out to um, uh, Mr. Verdow, uh, Matt Verdow, uh, about something else. And, you know, he's like, JC, contact me in six months. I'm busy coding. You know, he gets like into this. We got to have him on as a guest, actually, by the way, Matt Verdow. You know, he gets into this like coding mode and he just can't be. And I've known this guy for a zillion years. So this is not, uh, you know, is par for the course. When he gets yeah. into the zone. It's like focus, man. Um, good for him. Creates great product. We we use it, all of us. All right, let's uh, let's bring on Sam. Uh, Sam, I I don't have a bumper for you, so I'm just going to. Uh, How does Sam go have ahead a and? Uh, Sam is this is like his second appearance on the show, I think. So, um, and I I hope he Sam, you better have brought charts. I hope he brought charts. He did. Uh, so let's get him on here, Mr. Sam. The Sam. Intern? Yeah, Sam. What's up, Sam? What's up, guys? How's it going? What's going on? Shouldn't you be like in school or something? Uh, yeah, I should be. Yeah, this is more fun though. You're telling me, man. You're telling me. <laughs> I remember Louis. So Louis just graduated recently from the uh, uh, University of Auckland, and like years ago, he would be like messaging me. He'd be like, "JC, my professor just doesn't get it. Like, 
what you know what should i tell them i'm like just keep it to yourself lou just keep it to yourself you know that's how, what i've learned yeah it's not a battle you're gonna win what do you what's your what, what is your major uh bio biotech bio, biology uh yeah i'm a biotech Far major farming uh, no <laughs> gc no agriculture uh i think they just call it finance uh so you're a finance major yeah and yeah. then and how many how many finance classes have you taken uh funny enough that's uh not a lot um maybe three four and what and what year are a you lot in of accounting college? and things like that what year are you in uh this is my last semester of my senior year Ooh. Yeah. So finance major, they don't require a lot of finance classes, huh? Uh, funny enough, yeah. That sounds that's that sounds about right. Yeah. And um, so uh senior in college, at what school? Tell folks what school you go to. Uh Wichita State University. Woo shocks. Let's go. Let's go. Um and uh so you know, from from your perspective, you sit in on on all our meetings and you know, you hear our conversations back and forth, you're in our Slack. Why don't you why don't you tell me what you're seeing? Forget what I think. Forget what definitely forget what Spencer thinks. What do you think? What do you uh, see? Yeah, I, I see your all your points, JC, but uh I can't say I've been shorting stocks aggressively. Uh I I think there's a lot of pockets of strength out there. Um like the uh there's a lot of uh fresh base breakouts um that are like getting above their all time high av laps. Um Breaking above the thirty-eight point two retracement, those kind of have my attention more so than stocks Wait, that are. Did you just say AVWAP? Did you just say AVWAP? Yeah, uh, anchored VWAP. I don't know. Uh, wow, that's the I, first time I think I've ever heard that. Me too. Um, AVWAP. All right. Yeah, not a like, not uh, AVWAP. Not AVWAP. AVWAP. Yeah. All right. You can say like however it. you want. Um, but it. like, uh, kind of like setups like Robinhood have my attention. Um, Why? Well, you've got this massive base. Um, we're coming up. Uh, if you uh, drop a WAP from the all-time high, drop comes a in around 16. Uh, drop a WAP from the all-time low. It's become support here. We're, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, things what like about all the, what attention. about the relative weakness that you've been seeing in Robin Hood? Doesn't does it spook you? There's you been care? a lot of it. Um, but it's a bull market, you know. Um, you talk about it all the time. Uh reverse engineer the bull market and something like this should be working. Yeah, uh, this little tiny irrelevant brokerage firm, you think it should be working? Uh yeah, I mean, look at Coinbase. Uh I was gonna say Oh, I would say Coinbase not really irrelevant, but then, then how come Robin Hood's make is down near new all time relative lows? Like it just it's just I mean, it's it's hard to find something shittier than. Uh, no, it's no. not. There's lots of stuff. Hey, I'm just looking. To sell where do you, where like do you buy 16, this? Come on. So, Sam, where do you um, buy this? You buy it above that uh, little uh, 1159 WAP. Um, sell it at 16. I, that's a good Ele trade right there. So long above 11. So uh, long above 1160. Target of 15. 16. 16. Yeah. Back to those former highs from early 22. Yeah. All right. All right. So nothing yet, but by the breakout, I respect that. What else? Um, I've been putting together the uh, freshly squeezed report. Um, Which is what? Some, what that is. So we um, look for the um, stocks that are most heavily shorted, um, either by short interest, uh, days to cover. Um, and then we um, do some uh, relative strength overlays. Um, there's a lot of really attractive setups out there. Uh, biotechs come to mind. Um, those have been beaten down so bad for years, and they're they're starting to work. Um, I've got Vera Therapeutics, uh, Axum Therapeutics, Edgewise Therapeutics. Look at that um, Vera Therapeutics new all-time highs. Wow, there's some really nice setups there. Um, I've also noticed that um, the some people don't like the uh, the biotechs for eyes, like uh, glaucoma and things like that. Um, those are heavily. What do you mean, do you mean people don't like them? Like the investors uh, don't like, like them? I've or noticed you hear that's chatter? a theme. Like, like you've got biotechs as a theme that are heavily shorted, and then inside of that, you have eye drugs specifically um, are hated. Um, that's that's weird. Yeah, I found that, that that's you know what that is is that's eye opening. That's what that is. Oh, <laughs> stop it! 
good one. I can't. I can't with that. I can't. Oh, so cringy. You know, Sam, do you think that we could do a better job of, you know, dividing individual groups of biotechs like you just described? Because it's not something that we do. Yeah, I do. I do think that's a good Sounds thing. Sounds like a lot um, of work. I've been working. How do we uh, know if really, they're an, an um, eye drug or not? Like, it seems like a lot of work, no? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I've been working with Louis on uh, slicing up crypto into sectors and industries. Uh, yeah. That's been very interesting. Like, uh, when you do that, you see that, uh, like, smart contracts, uh, some of the hottest things out there. Um, like, it, you've got Ethereum, but then you have uh, Avalanche and uh, Solana. Um, those are some of the best. And then you have uh, Layer Zero, um, yeah. like Optimism, things like that. Optimism looks fantastic. Straza was pumping that on Friday. What about, this, what about this Bitcoin uh, dominance? Uh, pushing up against new multi-year highs. Thoughts there? Uh, I try not to overthink that. Um, it's nothing new, you know. It's been um, very strong. I, I, I'm a little surprised by it, to be honest. You know, I would have expected some outperformance out of the alts. So the Bitcoin dominance... This dominant, to me, it's surprising. I, I I wouldn't have expected that. Didn't see that one coming. The EBTC um, ratio is interesting too. Um, well, it's the same thing, isn't it? Getting slaughtered. Yeah, it's the same thing. Right? Yeah, because the the well, the X the X Bitcoin is a lot of that is Ethereum. The power, yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Fair yeah. Enough. Um. And uh, so when did you get into the market when like how do you get interested in this because I mean, you're, you're a young lad and you seem to to know a lot of things at a young age certainly things i didn't know at your age uh, well i i don't know uh my brother uh elijah uh he also went to wichita state and was kind of an economics junkie and uh twitter junkie and showed me uh all-star charts on twitter and you guys make it so simple and easy to understand. And I went down the rabbit hole and I still can't get out of it. So. Ne never came back out. <laughs> yeah, got you. So your brother's the one who got you into not only the market, but all-star charts as well. Yeah. And then what yes. is your brother doing these days? Is he like just a, a billionaire portfolio manager somewhere? Uh, not exactly. No, uh, <laughs> he's teaching uh, English classes in Turkey. Got it. So it took a little bit of a different route oh. there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. When are you going to so, go visit went, him? Have you visited him? I have not. No, I plan on doing that uh, once I graduate. Good for you. Uh, How, you gonna, are you going to do like a European tour? I don't know. That's uh, appealing for sure. I think you should. I didn't do that at that age. I didn't do it until like later in life and, you know. Uh, he's gonna, he's going to go meet up with uh, Caleb Franzen and they're, and they're going to go gallivanting around you Europe should. together. That's, yeah, that's, that's what you should do. Happen. And, you know, I got yeah. friends in all these cities. I'll hook you up with a whole bunch of people. Um, you know, if you have the opportunity to do it at that young of an age, so you don't have to wait as long as I did, you know, it's, you know, those experiences really help the way you think, make you more open-minded. Um, you know, you learn about some new foods that you haven't eaten. I always like that part, you know, meet some different people with different backgrounds that are not from Kansas, you know, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Sam, I want to ask you, uh, besides the, you know, the eye theme, is there anything that like we're not talking about right now that we're that we're now looking at that that we should be paying more attention to um i would mention uh like uh, mortgage lenders like uh matt ishiba's uh uwmc yeah um that's a nice base there um rocket mortgage as well yeah. um and then uh, something that has just blown me away this year has been uh encore wire um ticker w-i-r-e um yeah, twenty Whoa. days to cover twenty five percent short interest. This yep. is making all time highs versus the broader market. I don't, I don't understand what these short sellers are seeing here, but this is incredibly strong. No, that they're seeing pain. Is they're what seeing they're seeing pain? Yeah, this is one of those industrial. <laughs> like this position, it's been a heavy short position for a long time now. This is how. What's uh, the short ratio today, or the latest update? Uh, nineteen days to cover twenty four. Still, still, dude. It's been like this for months now. Wow, very aggressive, very aggressive. By the way, shout out Kansas. How was last night? Did you enjoy that? I enjoyed that. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, is is football your favorite sport, or you know, uh, is it just definitely basketball? I'm a basketball junkie. Uh, I was more excited about the Jayhawks beating Baylor, uh, to be honest. Then uh, winning the was, Super Bowl that was fun. 
Uh, I mean, the Chiefs are technically in Missouri, so. Uh, yeah. Ah, he got you he there, did, JC. Yeah, but, yeah, <laughs> but you still, still root for the Chiefs, though, right? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I grew up a Broncos yeah. fan. But, well, the Giants, uh, been, for the record, the Giants and the now. Jets play in New Jersey, but you know, so also true. I mean, Buffalo uh, claims to be the only team in New York. Uh, and, you know, they they are New York's. They are New York's it's team. It's very sad that they actually do say that. <laughs> yeah. All right, hey, it Sam, you want to you hang, yes, hang out for a recess? Sure. All right, let's do some recess, and then, then we'll get out of here. Oh. How about that? Sam's brother in the chat. Yeah. Elijah. Um, My recess was going to be... I. I was all excited to talk about all the great commercials last night and everything, and the, then there were no good commercials last night. So there weren't good commercials. Uh, I wasn't paying attention. Nothing was good. I didn't really see anything that I liked. Although the you know what was good, the halftime show. Yeah. Usher's oh yeah. Man. Brought me brought me back to middle school. Yeah. Brought me back <laughs> I loved to high it. school. <laughs> yeah. Great stuff. Oh, great stuff. But no, commercials are weak sauce. I thought last night. So. um my, I guess I'll just say, hey, uh, if you haven't seen uh, Too Big to Fail or read the book, check it out. It's a good movie. It's on HBO. I thought the um, the Robert Kraft. I saw the video on YouTube I, on uh, Twitter. I didn't see the uh, I didn't see it actually air, um, like the anti-Semitic sort of uh, garage painting. I don't know if you saw that. All right, then I pro- I, I guess honestly I probably just missed a lot of them. I thought maybe, that was maybe I thought opinion. that was good, like a good you know heartwarming uh, commercial that he paid out of his own money. I thought that was great. Those Dude, cool. yeah, Josh, the, the religion ads last night. So many ads for religion. Scientology. Oh my goodness. Really? Yes, there was so many religious ads last night. What do you got, Sam? What's, what's, got? On, what's on your mind outside the markets and and, and basketball and football? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my sister turned nineteen last week. Um, we had a little party for her, and uh, it's been a long time since I've had a, a tres leche cake. But uh, oh man, that is fantastic. You got the tres leches in Kansas. Yeah, they do. You got Mexicans they, there, though, right? A lot of Mexicans, yeah. They're That'll fantastic. do it. The Mexicans do a nice to this. They put a little too much lemon for my taste, but... Sam, there wasn't Sam, too much lemon. Here. Good, good, good. Sam, I wanted to ask you about this video you sent over last week. Uh, I love you leaning into the to the, the, the Midwestern thing. Were, were you at a cattle auction? I was at a cattle auction, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to play this buy video. Any? Buy any? She is a weasel. Wait, I'm going to play this video here. I just want to hear this guy talk. What is he saying? What? How much does one of these cows cost? Well, it, it depends on the cow. Like if the cow has a, a swollen foot or something, it can sell for uh, 50 cents a pound. But um, if the cow's in good shape, has uh, its vaccinations, it can go for uh, well over the market price. Um, uh, I saw one go for like, uh, I think it was like $3.15 a pound. Um, that's well over the market price now. And then so like, you um, know, if, if a cow's got a bum foot, you know, and you get it for fifty cents on the, you know, that is that a, is that a bad trade? You don't want to do that. Or you uh, just got to eat not, it right away. What does that you work? just have to kill it right away is the got problem, it. and you, it can't grow and things like that. Yeah, but it's cheaper um, that way. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't have to take care of it or anything. You can just right. feast. Yeah, it's not a bad trade. I'm into. Uh, the, I think I'm into the ones with the bum foot. I'm into that. Dumpster diving. <laughs> As, yeah, I'm dumpster diving in the cattle markets. If <laughs> I lived right. in Kansas and I would go do these things, that's what I would do. That would be my move. <laughs> The ribeye is going to taste the same whether he's got a bump foot or not. It's true, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's me. That, 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 that's the beginning of the uh, live cattle futures market uh, supply chain, JC, right there. Uh, All right. And then, I'm into yeah. It. Yeah. All right. Uh, 10 o'clock. Let's get out of here. Uh, thanks to our guest today. Thanks to Sam. Thanks to Josh thanks. Brown. Thanks to all of you for hanging out in the chat. Uh, Straza will be back uh, tomorrow, uh, we hope, um, if the conference isn't too good. 
And uh, that's what we got. So smash the like. As always, check out our links in the description, the hot corner, the chart report. They're free. They're daily. And they're awesome. Uh, go make some money. And we'll see you guys later. Thanks, Adios. Sam. Thanks, Sam. Shout out, Elijah. Let it. I can't take no loss. Huh. I don't even know what it costs.